Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Kernels of Truth brought to you by Progress Kentucky. We have a wonderful episode for you tonight. After we check in with tonight's co-host, maybe co-host, uh, we will do our uh, political news roundup. Uh, we've got a call to action on uh, marijuana criminal reform for uh, for Kentucky. And then finally, we've got an interview with blue collar writer, union organizer, Matt Alley. Uh, but first, our quick plug for Progress Kentucky. Uh, we're an all volunteer campaign committed to turning Kentucky purple uh, by supporting compassionate policies, which put people first. And if you care about that mission and wanna help us meet our goal of raising $1,500 for our current organizing effort, please head to our secure Act Blue uh, funding page and make a donation. Anything you can do is, is, is much appreciated. Uh, 50 bucks, 500 bucks, five bucks, somewhere in between there. Whatever you do, uh, we will put it to good work. And as I mentioned, we're all volunteers. So it's not going to, you know, somebody's inflated salary. No corporate CEOs are making a bunch of money off this effort. That's for sure. Uh, all right. So let's check in. Uh, we're going to see uh, what's up with our co hosts this evening. They're going to tell us who they are, where they are, and then what does their protest sign say today? Uh, because of course it's not it's not some new show. Uh, it is a digital demonstration. Uh, we are fighting the man here at uh, Kernels of Truth, uh, factually fighting the man. So I'm Aaron. I'm in Childsburg, uh, just you know a, a lovely little suburb uh, in Lexington, and my sign today says uh, Mitch supports sedition. That's 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 what I got for uh, for you guys today, um, and I'm going to check in uh, with with some co-hosts. But I'm also going to ask you, viewer. Uh, we've got some viewers, which is awesome. Uh, show us that you're here. Put it in the comments. Where are you? Uh, and what does your protest sign say tonight? And I will read the best ones on uh, on live with us right now. So uh, let's throw it to uh, to Nate. Hey, Nate. Hey, Aaron. Uh, this is Nate Orshan coming live from uh, Kitchen My Home here in South Frankfurt. And uh, tonight, my protest sign is another long one. Sorry, guys. It's going to say, Thomas Massey, have a heart. Wear a mask and do your part. Hurt my shave. <laughs> you know, I'm a sucker for the internal rhyme on your uh, <laughs> protest signs. That's for sure. Uh, awesome. Uh, how about you, Ken? Hello, I'm Ken Howe. Uh, how uh, coming here uh, to you from Lexington, uh, Kentucky, and I have a couple of questions uh, for uh, some quotes. It's 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 long and it's all it's it's a very interesting protest sign. I've drawn maps and it's a whole conspiracy of of actuality. Did Marie Antoinette say let them eat cake? What about uh, Sergeant Joe Friday? Did he say just the facts, ma'am? Uh, did not Neil Armstrong say, that's one small step for man? Did Captain Kirk say, beam me up, Scotty? What about Rand Paul? Did he say we shouldn't presume that a group of experts somehow know what's best during a pandemic? One of these statements is an actual verbatim quote. Guess which? That one, the one that sounds crazy, right? So my protest sign is for Rand Paul who seems to fight the truth and experts in reality daily uh, at every point during this pandemic. So uh, my uh, protest sign is, is Rand Paul, conspiracy causes catastrophe. Dum, dum, dum. Back to you, <laughs> Oh, Oh, you wish it was back to me. I've got some questions, Ken. So what you're saying in that lead up, <laughs> yes. Ken always gets a lot more lead up to his protest signs. Has anyone else noticed that? Uh, have In that lead up, you are implying that Joe Friday did not say just the facts, ma'am. Neil Armstrong did not say that's one small step for man. And Kirk didn't say beam me up, Scotty. He said none of those. Those are all those are all misquotes. They're fake things. There were that's no one small step for Captain man. Kirk I have heard the clip. Scotty. That's one uh, small step for it man. It was Neil Armstrong did say one step for a man, or at least that's what he told us. I mean, he could be lying to us. I mean, but who's to really say? I've heard the audio. Uh, yes. I think he screwed it up. up. He was supposed to say for a man, but he's. I heard the audio. He says for 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 man. They spent seven hundred thousand dollars. 
to figure as of that tonight, our new name is the Colonels of Apocryphal Truth. <laughs> I guess it's like quotes around truth. Uh, yeah, Rand Paul, that guy. <laughs> like I said, you're not outraged. You're not paying attention uh, to Rand Paul. All right. So speaking of Rand Paul, we are going to get jump into news of the week. Uh, and this is a fun one because we're watching the hair twins this week. <laughs> Proud libertarians <laughs> who make folks cringe across our Commonwealth uh, on the regular. Rand Paul and Thomas Massey. Uh, Thomas Massey, of course, the representative for Kentucky's fourth district, which includes uh, the Cincinnati suburbs there in northern uh, northern Kentucky. Uh, I like to call them liver hair twins. Get it? Liver hair twins. All right. Uh, so story Thank number you, one. We're out of time. <laughs> we got plenty of time. Um, we are going on uh, to, to Nate for the first story. All right. Well, <laughs> you sort of gave away who this is about. So, uh, but this is a story about one of Kentucky's Congress people doing something really stupid and really irresponsible. Uh, and of course, we're talking about none other than the guy representing the fourth district way up north. Uh, the guy with a master's in mechanical engineering, but a doctorate, air quotes, in smug skepticism for most scientific consensus and advice. Yes, <laughs> Representative Thomas Massey, come on down. Yes, my friends, as reported in the Courier Journal last Thursday, May 20th, Congressman Massey got a $500 fine from the House of Representatives for what? For not wearing a mask in the chamber even after being asked point blank by a member of the sergeant at arms staff that he wear a mask, as is the current rule. Okay, so let's back up. So unless you've been living under a slab of concrete, you probably heard that the Centers for Disease Control recently published new guidance to the effect that if you've been fully vaccinated against the coronavirus, you're okay not using a mask inside under most situations. But here's the deal for all you fully vaccinated folks out there, and this is coming straight from the CDC's own webpage for this, updated May 16th, entitled, When You've Been Fully Vaccinated, How to Protect Yourself and Others. Quote, you can resume activities without wearing a mask or staying six feet apart, except, 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 except where required by federal, state, local, tribal, or territorial laws, rules, and regulations, including local business and workplace guidance. Well, what do you know? The place where Massey works, the U.S. House of Representatives, has rules, regulations, and guidance, and they state that he needs to keep his mask on in the chamber unless he's up there speechifying at the podium. So that's one way that Congressman Massey earns a big old <clears throat> And then there's the other part of this. He hasn't even been vaccinated. He's walking around telling people that, uh, uh, you know, I already got COVID, so I can't spread the coronavirus. Here's the deal. Last year, he told Courier Journal that because he'd received a positive antibody test in July 2020, quote, I'm not a high risk category and I trust my natural immune response over a pharmaceutically stimulated response, unquote. Never mind that we don't know how long the coronavirus immune response lasts on its own. And here we are nine months later, but whatever. Your congressional colleagues deserve a little more than your promise Thomas, where's the proof the congressman even had that antibody test that excuses this boorish behavior? And that brings us to point three. If Congressman Massey thinks he totally gets the science, then he should know that there are variants out there that he still could catch, even if he got this mythical positive antibody test last year. And that is where, my friends, we get to the serious heart of this story. We all know that Massey is a flaming libertarian who never met a government rule or regulation he wouldn't love to drown in the fountainhead, get it? But he's more than that. He's more than a legislator. He's a leader. He's supposed to be modeling the kind of behavior that we want all citizens to emulate, to imitate. All Americans who care about the health of their neighbors, of the health of their community, and of our country and our shared culture. Instead, what he's modeling is irresponsible, antisocial stupidity. And that's not leadership. That's not even considerate. That's corrosive to our culture. That's sabotage to our society. And it's the latest in a long list of Congressman Massey's actions and antics that Kentuckians will remember with shame for decades to come. Back to you, Aaron. 
Yeah, that you nailed it. Uh, what a jerk. But you know, is he really a leader? Or is he just a follower? Right? Is he just like, there's a there's a core of folks that this resonates with, you know, a bunch of Republican men. And so he's like, getting to the front of the parade, you know, and say, look at me, look at me. I don't know. I, Ken, what do you think about this? Well, <laughs> uh, the, there's a line in this article that Nate was talking about, that kind of gripped me. It, it's should should Matt Massey uh, he he's fighting uh, the Congress as if the the mask was some kind of maybe dress code that that's what uh, really stood out to me. There was a line in that article that would talked about a dress code for like he could maybe do a defense like oh I don't have to wear a tie or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, it reminds me of when I was in high school and I couldn't wear baggy pants or ICP garb or. You know, the girls couldn't wear short shorts. Uh, Republicans across the country uh, continue to push things like like banning braids and twists and lock hairstyles. Uh, so would it be hypocr hypocritical for, for uh, Massey to want to ban masks if, if it's in the dress code? Uh, is this an argument? I don't know. Maybe hazmat suits are a bad idea and, and chemical spills or surgeons don't need to wear PPE to protect themselves. I'm guessing he's for the dress code, except for when maybe he's a, he's against it. I don't know. What do you think, Aaron? Uh, I, <laughs> I think he's a mask hole. I'll just say it. Uh, yeah. Ooh. And uh, I will point of order before we move on to the next story, uh, which is mine, because folks are probably watching the show, you know, uh, and going, wait, the card said Kimberly was going to be a host and Kimberly's not there. Kimberly's always here. She is reliable. She is dependable. She brings her, uh, you know, amazing energy and engagement to the show every week. And we appreciate that. She is right now running for something. So she is uh, running for LD at large for the uh, Democratic Party in Jefferson County and his in her uh, her congressional or legislative district. So we're sending good vibes her way right now. We're hoping that she'll pop on with with positive news about the outcome of her election. If not, everyone pretend that, you know, we didn't know that. Uh, but yeah, I think the, um, you know, uh, that's why she's not here right now. She might be here a little bit later. I also did want to note that we had some uh, fantastic protest signs shared in the chat. So I wanted to uh, go ahead and add that. Doug Price says his sign, he's coming from Harrison County. His sign says Rand Paul, AKA Curly Joe. Uh, is, uh, is what he's saying. <laughs> and then Annabelle Nagel, who just uh, today, her last full day of high school, because she's graduating, uh, she said gun control now, and now is all caps. So that's her mood today. Uh, so we had a few wonderful additions there in the chat. Wanted to call them out. Everyone, go ahead, put it in there. Sandy's got one. Uh, he does not have a sign, though. He's got some tweets that he's sharing. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching. And that's what you, why you should watch is because you will be shared on the internet live if you share your, uh, your great ideas there. All right, so I'm gonna go on to story number two in news of the week. Uh, part two of our liber hair a twin story. Uh, Rand Paul is a vax hole. So he won't get vaccinated and big brother can't tell him to do so. Uh, this is a story that's been around. He's quoted some, you know, some podcast not ours. Uh, <laughs> although, you know, he's welcome. If he wants to come on, we'd be more than welcome, you know, be more than welcome to come on. We'd love to chat with him about his misguided policies. He's uh, quoted in this thing saying, each individual assumes their own risk. And the thing is, if someone chooses not to be vaccinated and you are vaccinated, they're not a risk to you, he said. They're taking a risk for themselves, which, you know, I guess there it is. That's libertarianism, right? In a nutshell, it's just about me. And it, if it's a risk to me, it doesn't matter as long as it doesn't affect you. But that's the, that, that right there, I think is the inherent flaw of libertarianism. Like we live in a society, people, it's not just about your decision and whether they affect you and harm you. And if your decision, you know, if your decision harms other people, then you need to be, you know, you, we need to be reconciling that as a society. And that's the thing about not getting vaccinated. So the guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention say those who previously contracted the virus should still get vaccinated. 
as experts do not yet know how long you're protected from getting sick again after recovering from COVID-19, right? And so, you know, if you remember Senator Paul, Senator, I got COVID and then didn't tell anyone, Paul, uh, got it at that Speed Museum event, I think, then came back to DC, <laughs> knew that there was a possibility he had it because everyone, you know, that was, that was a hot spot. That was a super spreader event, knew he was there, uh, and then, you know, went swimming in the congressional pool with a bunch of other really old, <laughs> vulnerable humans uh, and didn't feel compelled to like isolate himself. Uh, so yeah, big, you know, constant thread with this guy as he puts himself first, doesn't care about, you know, where he's stacking the lawn refuse, <laughs> doesn't talk to his neighbor about it. Uh, you know, this is a guy who does not care about anyone else. And so this is very much in keeping with his behavior that of course he wouldn't get vaccinated, even though his case of COVID was incredibly slight, right? It was like this kind of asymptomatic case. So what does that mean? That means you probably don't have amazing antibodies built up. Uh, and, but, you know, don't take it from me because I'm not a doctor. I'm just some guy on the internet. Uh, but there was a wonderful opinion piece by Kevin Cavanaugh, who's a retired physician from Somerset, and he's the chairman of Health, Health Watch USA. Uh, and there's some great quotes in here. What Rand Paul ignores is that the decision to not become vaccinated also affects the health and safety of others, which is what I was alluding to. There's also no doubt that Paul is at risk for reinfection. He's had an asymptomatic or mild illness over a year ago, which was probably caused by the original wild type of virus. Unless he's been repeatedly re-exposed to the virus, he is a sitting duck for COVID-19. And remember, 10 to 20% of those with even mild to moderate disease can develop the devastating effects of long COVID. Right. So, you know, uh, this uh, this, I think, captures it very well. Uh, and then Dr. Kavanaugh goes on to kind of refer vaguely to Rand's frequent fights with actual COVID expert, Dr. Fauci. Uh, and he says, I'm sorry, Senator Paul, but the only thing that stood between President Trump and the United States suffering the devastation found in India was Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, the largest group of individuals not getting the vaccine are Republicans, especially Republican males. Those of you who feel the anti-vaxxers should just suffer the false, uh, suffer the fate and judgment of nature need to remember that infectious diseases will come back to haunt us all and herd immunity will never be achieved unless our country's vaccination rates increase. That's a really good close to that because there is a little bit of that in, you know, and I try not to be super cynical or too angry or too hateful, but the idea of like, well, if they don't wanna get vaccinated, fine. <laughs> but no, they don't deserve that because that will then spread on, right? If we've got enough of a bunch of folks not vaccinated, we allow for more mutations, we allow for different strains that will over, you know, this will be like the flu, right? It'll just keep coming back every single year with different strains uh, and they'd have to do boosters, like predicting which strain's gonna do well. And that's not, you know, that's not ideal. That's not optimal. If we wanna get back to normal, get your goddamn vaccine, people. Just do it. You know, they're like, I'm sorry. Like there are people who cannot legitimately get vaccinated, right? Uh, because of health conditions. And we can't, you know, okay. So we have to make up for them. Uh, we all have to do it. We have to do our part. Uh, and Rand Paul, God damn it, uh, do the right thing and get vaccinated. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's story number two uh, in news of the week. Uh, Ken, you have some thoughts you wanna share about, uh, about Rand Paul? I do. Uh, my first, my, th you can't, you can't say GD on the radio, and and if we ever are on a radio show, <laughs> you can't say it. Uh, hey, hey, anyway, the question was, do you want to talk about Rand Paul? The question was not, <laughs> do you need to critique Aaron's uh, commentary about Rand Paul? Yeah, save it for the after absolutely. party. Absolutely, absolutely. I I feel like Rand Paul is all about misinformation. And, and we, I feel like a broken record because we talk about this just about every single week. Uh, this, this week he did a uh, super epic meme drop on Facebook about a, a place called the National, oop, the Nas <laughs> National uh, Science Fo Foundation. He was, uh, I guess this goes along with, he refuses to listen to what Fossey says. And so he he's like attacking science on all fronts and so he did this super epic meme drop meme drop 
and his memes are pretty simple. They they don't show his work or how he concluded anything. No source links. He posted nine of these anti-science memes about the agency and, a, and the way it spends its money. Uh, there are grants for all kinds of things that Rand uh, just doesn't seem to want to understand or, or question about the world around himself. He seems to want to just live in his own little personal space. Uh, sure, some of the research objectives were quirky or weird, or they, but who didn't watch and enjoy the men who stare at goats? which I found to be a fast, it was kind of an obscure movie that not all of us have seen, but I, I found that it was good. Uh, but anyway, without these kind of random little research projects, we wouldn't have things like computers or the internet, webcams, GPS, radar, flu shots, MRIs, Google touchscreens, different prosthetics, lithium batteries. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, we wouldn't be in any kind of space race. We certainly wouldn't have this vaccine. Uh, Brand is a jealous, lazy man, as far as I can tell, who likes creating memes and hates having curiosity about science. He has this self-image where, where he pretends to know it all. And when scientists do research and hard work to make proof of a theory, he gaslights the facts and is confused at why people pick on him. I'm not into victim blaming, but Rand acts like the victim of some conspiracy day in and day out, and he could really do some research. But if he did research, he he wouldn't be in the news every day for saying something completely insane and crazy. And, you know, whether or not he's lying about if he's going to take the vaccine or not i i guess we'll find out when he either gets COVID again or doesn't <laughs> that that's pretty much my my take on this will he get COVID wait, again who knows wait a minute how much did the national science foundation spend on figuring out whether uh neil armstrong said a man or man yes yeah, seven hundred thousand uh, dollars on on i feel like it's excessive excessive but you know i think they, that well i mean it's it's just unfortunate they couldn't pin it down like i would i would have liked to have a definitive answer on that one i sure. bet they developed some kind of um software that did a good job of tweaking the frequencies i'm sure nate knows all about frequencies and tweaking a voice to make it so you could sound uh yeah or, or at least tweaking <laughs> tweaking yeah he's definitely tweaking have you moved, has anyone seen Nate twerk though? That's a whole different thing, and uh, we're gonna save that for the after party, I suppose. Andy Bar the door. <laughs> what about Andy Bar? I hate that guy. All right, so uh, we are gonna move on. <laughs> we are gonna, we're gonna leave this one uh, and move on to the next segment, which is uh, our call to action, and this one I'm ex uh, exceptionally proud of because uh, if you remember last week. We had Reverend Clark Williams on and we talked about the racial disparities in marijuana prosecution uh, in Kentucky and in Lexington specifically. And uh, I feel like that's an important issue. That's an issue that we should work on because it is absolutely uh, racist prosecutions that are happening. Uh, also, it is, you know, it's just outrageous that really anyone's getting prosecuted for this uh, when many of our uh, neighbor states and states across this country have legalized it completely. Uh, it is a wasted opportunity to develop tax resources. It is a, a lot of wasted potential uh, fighting uh, these, you know, these prosecutions. Uh, people you know, really shouldn't have to worry about this, I don't think. Uh, our nation needs to move on. So we have created on our Action Network website uh, an ability for you to send a letter to uh, Attorney General Dan Cameron asking him to deprioritize uh, marijuana prosecutions. Uh, I hope you will take action. Across our Commonwealth, Black defendants make up 27% of all possession charges while making up just 8% of our state's population. Uh, research shows that Black people use marijuana pretty much the same rate as white folks. Actually, I do think white folks use it a little bit more uh, more frequently, but uh, there was a wonderful article a couple weeks ago in the um, 
in the Lexington paper uh, and did some research. It looks at it, it makes it very clear there are racial disparities in how marijuana laws are being enforced. Louisville's actually passed an ordinance deprioritizing marijuana enforcement. We think it's time for the state to follow Louisville's lead on this. Help us send a message to AG Dan Cameron. So visit our Action Network page right now. Send a letter to Cameron. Uh, tell him to uh, to take action to help make uh, marijuana enforcement deprioritized and less racist. So do it, do it now. Should be in the comments, uh, click through, don't cost nothing. Uh, all right, so that's your call to action. Do we have a, do we, we don't have a theme song for the call to action, do we? No, we should, we but really should. I did. I sent, I sent, uh, I put my name in. You sent the letter? Sent, sent the letter. It was very easy. Sent the letter. I trust it. I, I usually don't trust things that I find on the internet. Well, it's ours. Around, it is ours, Ken. One. So <laughs> I'm glad that you, you you took that leap of faith and trusted us. Uh, we already had your email address. All right. So uh, next, uh, next, very exciting. Uh, we are going to be uh, bringing on our guest. But before I do that, I wanted to just mention a couple of things about, you know, the, the context for his, uh, for his interview, right? So we here in Kentucky, we have the most powerful Republican Senator in the world, which is not of course, Rand Paul, cause he's just mostly a joke, uh, but Mitch McConnell. And Mitch McConnell has gone out of his way to talk about how important it is to end the uh, support for unemployment. Yeah, he doesn't like the fact that we are continuing to help people out uh, who you know are having a problem, you know, problem getting back into the workforce because of COVID? Because there's a lot of people who are really still suffering, right? Uh, and one of the things that seems to be lost there, right? It's like, oh my God, we're paying people such outrageous amounts of money that they won't get back into the workforce. It's not an outrageous amount of money. It is barely enough to like be whole uh, and not just find yourself in, you know. Uh, in poverty, right? So it's like, oh, that's so outrageously, you know, exorbitant that we're giving them enough to stay out of poverty. But I guess it's all about comparison, right? Uh, because the Kentucky Center for Economic Policy, who we really think that they do amazing work, uh, you know, they ran the numbers. 40% of Kentucky's jobs pay less than $15 an hour. I'm gonna say that one more time. 40% of Kentucky's jobs pay less than $15 an hour. Almost half don't provide health insurance, 70% don't include retirement benefits, and 38% have zero paid sick days. So uh, if you want people to get back to work, maybe we should pay them more. <laughs> maybe that would get them to come back. Uh, maybe also if you know their kids were in school or had you know something they could be doing, uh, because when your kids are virtual, you cannot afford childcare on one of these you know four out of ten Kentucky jobs that pay less than fifteen dollars an hour. So you know I, I, the Republicans continue to astound me and how out of touch they are with reality. Uh, but one man who has made it his life's mission uh, to, you know, raise, uh, people's standards, uh, at work, uh, is Matt Alley, who is our, uh, guest right now, blue collar writer, Matt Alley. Uh, he's a teamster. He's entering his 20th year as a union organizer. He's a former writer for the, uh, United Mine Workers of, uh, of America Journal. He's also a second generation union member whose father helped organize the last union coal mine in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, he goes, well, he's got a lot of handles. Uh, you can call him Matt, but he likes blue collar writer, union thug, and the Appalachian refugee. So welcome to the show, Matt Alley. I think you might be muted. All right, try it now. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here, guys. Um, well, let's just start off by saying Mitch is being Mitch again, huh? So what else can we expect? Um, you know, this unemployment debate is starting to now reach the point where I'm hearing, how can I put this, their memes are starting to roll through the comments of my page now and the tweet comments and whatnot, and they're regurgitating what yeah, their think tanks are saying, which is usually Coke based, you know, so. Um, <laughs> Anyways, so let's let this thing roll and see where it goes, okay? 
yeah, I hear you. Uh, you know, so it's it's amazing to me, right? So here we are in Kentucky. It's a right to work state. Maybe you can tell us what that is. But if we look around us, we're seeing, uh, you know, other states are cutting the uninsurance, the unemployment insurance, uh, you know, additional uh, funds that are going to help people out. Uh, Andy has been uh, resistant to that, thank God, uh, so far, but all around him, right, all these other right to work states are uh, absolutely more than happy to make sure that people can't live with any dignity, right, and force them exactly. into a, a horrible labor pool. Uh, and, you know, to hell with what their kids are going through with their parents and what they're trying to manage this kind of the impacts of, of COVID. Because of course, you know, most kids can't get vaccinated. You know, a lot of schools are, you know, aren't really back. And if they're now they're going to be out. So like, what are you doing for the summer? It's very challenging time to be, to be a worker in these, these states. Uh, and you just don't see a lot of sympathy from these political leaders, you know, from the Republican side of the aisle, right? I mean, it seems right. to me incredibly clear that Democrats fight for workers you know, you know, day in and day out, not always as, you know, as, as well as we would like them to, right? Uh, there's a lot of corporate inference, influence on both political parties. But, uh, you know, we, we know very clearly that Democrats do a much better job, uh, you know, advocating for workers and fighting for workers, uh, you know, but one thing I wanted to just touch on really quickly, what is a right to work state? You know, why should we care about that? It's a, it's a phrase that's tossed around. It seems great. I mean, who doesn't want the right to work? Like, I want to I want to be able to work. Sure. What does that mean, Matt? Well, right to work for less is how we always refer to it as um, it, basically, it basically means if there is a union in your workplace, you do not have to pay dues, but you are protected by them. It was a union and we have to fight for you. Um, basically, you're a free rider. You get everything for free without paying dues. You get the representation. And those resources that come from union dues pay for, for lawyers, pay for union organizers to grow your union, which that is a key. It was everything. If you have more power, more members, then you have more bargaining. Um, right, right to work also usually lessens things. Uh, many stats have proven that in right to work states, uh, we have higher death rates on the job. Um, it busts unions. Uh, if you do, you know, even if you don't work union, you're usually being benefited from unions being in your workforce, similar, you know, or in your state, locally, wherever, we raise the bar. And without us, who's there to fight for you? Even via comparison of even the fear of us, let's say, uh, wages go, go down everything it just well look look at the states that are right to work the numbers are there they do not prosper yeah yeah and i'll, I'll be i'm by i'm completely biased i've never i've never been a member of a union uh but my uh my great grandfather uh, helped found a teamsters local uh in centralia chehalis washington uh mm -hmm. he was a milk truck driver uh, and then rose to, you know, be one of the, the main organizers of that union or leaders of that union. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like a lot of stories from the family about, uh, about the politics of the union and, uh, and being engaged in politics. So uh, I, am, I am not an unbiased uh, observer on this issue. I, you know, I think it's critically important that, you know, workers organize, you know, because corporations are very well organized. Uh, and the idea that they are going to just give you, you know, what's in your best interest uh, just ignores common sense. So what, an issue that got a lot of attention uh, recently was the Amazon strike in Alabama, uh, where we saw some really, you know, seemed like some pretty impressive organizing. I mean, heck, they got Joe Biden, the sitting president, to, to weigh in in favor uh, you know, Joe Biden's like, I don't care what the Washington Post says about me. I am going to you know, come out in favor of these Amazon workers who are trying to form a union. It didn't seem, you know, didn't go the way a lot of folks wanted it to. Uh, and the workers voted that down. What's your take on that? What should we learn from, from that experience? Well, this is a perfect example of um, the deck is all going to be stacked against workers when they try to organize. Most people don't realize how hard the process is. I know when I got started as an organizer, I had one of those old labor dogs tell me, son, if you organize one in your career, 
you've had a great career, you're recognized too, you're a rock star. And that is how hard it is because I mean, people don't, don't understand the process. First, you see if the working crews are going, you know, if they want a union, they come to you, they say, we want to make change at our workplace. Then you go through the process of feeling things out from the union side going, okay, is this worth the investment of union members dues? Because, you know, it has to come from somewhere to pay for, for things, to pay to put organizers in, the lawyers there and whatnot. And then after you, let's say, gauge the workforce, you could have anywhere from 30 to 70% that want it. Then you get those on card, and then the company starts the anti-union campaign. They can have closed door meetings, captive audience meetings, where while at the workplace, they can do their propaganda the entire shift if they want to. There's no rules that say they can't. And what happened in Alabama, I wanted this to win so badly, but of course, I really kind of saw it coming because you know, you were fighting Amazon and they were spending millions on anti-union consultants. And we've seen, you know, everything that looked like now with the issues of who had access to the, um, the ballot box with, uh, you know, and there was everything that was just brought up that was, they changed the, the traffic lights so it would speed up faster so that, so that the workers could get out without having to, you uh, come in contact with you with union organizers that can be standing legally on the street to talk to them or hand out information. And, you know, this is how it works. This is atypical. And I'm glad to see, actually, the only good thing that I could see came from this was the spotlight that was shown on it. And more people now realize, hey, these companies are just screwing these workers. While, you know, like Amazon, for example, making billions in profit. Yeah, I, I that the thing about the the traffic light amazed me, right? <laughs> it's like, wait, does Amazon control the traffic light in and out of their facility? Because that should be a public resource. So who who did they get to to change the timing so there wasn't enough time for the union organizers to actually talk to people uh, on their way out of the factory or that factory or the you know whatever mm -hmm. the their fulfillment center is, uh, very unfulfilling work uh, at the fulfillment centers. Uh, but yeah, it was definitely, it was amazing to see the spotlight. Another issue that out of Alabama that seems to be getting a fair amount of attention is the uh, United Mine Workers of America uh, strike at the Warrior Met Coal uh, Mine in Tuscaloosa County. Uh, it looks like some folks were just arrested uh, out, uh, during a protest outside that, uh, that mine. Uh, what's the story with that, uh, with that issue, with that, you know, that mine in Alabama and how would you compare, you know, you know, mine workers across the country? I, I feel like I hear a lot about mine workers in Kentucky and I don't hear a lot about unionized mine workers in Kentucky. And is that the right to work thing kind of like rearing its ugly head or, you know, what's the state of the United Mine Workers of America these days? Well, uh, first, let me first say about this, about what happened in Alabama, but today, uh, the last report I read from our friends at UConn blog was those were 10 former veterans that were union members who were also arrested. That's, you know, process. Uh, um, uh, what's going on in Alabama is uh, they want, I mean, they made concessions to help the company get through the bankruptcy. That's a long tangled story that uh, the end, the end industry has been ripe with bankruptcies. Um, and they were just wanting to go back to the wages that they had when they were in 2016, um, and have better than an 80, 20 insurance. That's one of the things about being a coal miner is the insurance is a huge factor. Uh, there's more of a chance that you're going to need better insurance especially in retirement because of the sacrifices you're making upon, it was upon your body. Um, some of the complaints for the premiums they're going to have to pay. So, you know, that's another example of uh, Warrior Matt was just trying their best to be like, hey, you know, we can't afford to do this, but our owners are making millions, but we can't pay you. And I believe there's a bonus involved too, they got, but I'm not sure about that one. So 
Uh, the state of the UMWA in um, Kentucky, I believe the last Union Mine shut down in Western Kentucky that was still active, um, maybe eight years ago. And I think you have about 11,000 UMWA retirees and widows that are still left in Kentucky, including my dad, who is a proud UMWA retiree. Um, the issue has been during the last coal boom, let's say, you know, 10 years ago, they were hiring people. Basically, there's, this is a huge problem for Kentucky and other industries too, is the subcontractor status. You're not an actual employee of the actual company. Um, and that makes it a whole lot harder to organize, but what made it even worse is you have, you know, young men mainly, not being sex this year, but let's just be honest with the industry who was working in it, 18 to 30 some years old, making about an average of about 70 grand. You couldn't really sway someone that young with saying, hey, if you thought about your retirement one day, and they're like, yeah, okay, yeah, it doesn't matter, you know? I've got a 401k. We know how great those things are. That's said with great sarcasm. Um, and, uh, the, you know, they didn't care about medical. You know, they're young, they're healthy, they're whatever. If they had the threat of another, you know, uh, even a hint of a union, hey, there was a rape. I knew a young man who was 19 years old who was allowed to work all the other for time he wanted. And he cleared about eight to grand one year at 19 years old. So they basically use the, well, well, they use capitalism for all it was worth for them, okay? And until they ran it bankrupt and they ran it dry and the industry vultured in itself. Um, and <clears throat> that's where the state of things are at. And right now, I don't have the stats in front of me about how many mines are still open, but I am positive to say that you know, sadly, the union stronghold that it used to be just it was not there, just, uh, and it had a lot to do with, like I said, the subcontractor status. Uh, capitalism, I think it's worse of raising, you know, throwing raises at, it, at them, not paying into things like retirement and health care. Um, and yeah, that's where things have been at. Yeah. And, you know, at the same time, you're seeing the kind of erosion of, of the kind of union uh, influence in Kentucky mines. You're seeing this resurgence in black lung, right? You know, and kind of some yes. of the, the methods they're using, you're seeing more black lung and you're seeing a lot of politics getting in the way of actually being able to say that it's black lung and holding people accountable for it, right? So, right. yeah, you know, clearly... Our politicians, no friends of unions, you know, none of the, you know, none of the Republicans have, have ever done a thing worthwhile here in Kentucky for those guys. And it's, it's sad to say, see that that, you know, kind of once strong, you know, uh, stronghold of union organizing is just not even really a factor anymore. But it's clearly, you know, the United Mine Workers are active and they are working for people. Uh, they just, you know, might not be working for folks in Kentucky currently working. Right. It's great that they're, they're, right. they're absolutely protecting their retirees. And that's a really important piece of the union. Um, and, you know, it's, it's astounding to me. Right. Because I don't know, like I want to talk about the PRO Act before we let you go. Uh, but I, I also want to just talk about just the, the dynamics of it. Right. The cultural dynamics of the unions. I mean, I know but I'm like a blazing liberal. Like I know how important unions are. Like I'm not a blue car collar worker. I've never like, you know, I haven't worked for a, a unionized uh, workforce, uh, but a lot of folks I know have, right? So I have a, a couple of folks who are in my family tree, very close, close uh, on my family tree. Uh, and they have really good retirements because, you know, they were unionized workers. Uh, but to hear them talk, to hear them bash Democrats at every opportunity, to hear them bash unions like, at this point, right? Like, like, wait a minute. I know you've got amazing health care. I know you've got a pension. And I know that all became came to you because of your union. Why are you talking smack about unions right now? It it is astounding to me. I don't I, you think about this stuff, you write about this stuff, Matt. What is what why in the world? are these folks 
proudly voting Republican, when they are living off the sacrifices that their union made to to help that help set them up for the long haul? I my personal experience, okay. Um, and I have lived all over for this great state of uh, it was Kentucky. And I have noticed just where, let's say you were God, well, you were grandfathered into a union. Uh, you weren't, you know, it was just a place that when it became your time and you couldn't find another job, you got the job at wherever, you know. And you, but it had been two or three or four or five generations since the original fight happened when those workers initially had to fight the company, organize. And uh, I hate to pick on Boyd County because I love my friends there, but they were the perfect example of when your, your income status keeps going up and up in the middle class, and, you know, you move into the suburbs and you worry about, geez, I'm being taxed for this, I'm being taxed for that. The propaganda that the right wingers play in on it, going, well, you, you know, you know, your, you know, your union dues are paying for these evil liberals, you know, that want to, you know, insert whatever scare tactic you want to, from abortion, whatever, and they majorly play in on on the it was economic makes them look. I earned what I'm doing. There's no good people out there just won't get a job, you know, and we have, and that's where we as union folks have to keep our membership engaged and remind them of where we come from, the fight that's still going on, on, on out there, and remind some folks, hey, you remember when you first got started and you were struggling, you know, somebody else is doing that too, and I think that has us a lot to do with us as unions are going to have to keep re-engaging and re-engaging and re-engaging, and I will say this, I am so proud of these younger kids coming up right now because they get it, they see it, they understand the fight that they're, you know, they are looking around the jobs that what are they going to work at to actually earn a real living now? Retail? Come on. Even though we can look at Walmart and other companies like that and say, hey, you can't share the wealth and it's not going to hurt you. Uh, and there's no reason why these jobs cannot be union. But again, yeah. Yeah, we're in a major cultural change right now. Uh, membership, and I love it, is diversifying. 49% of union members are women now, and we need more women leaders to understand everything that they can bring to the table and make change. And, 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 and this engagement, the education, it's no longer really, you know, I love my moniker of Blue Collar Rider, but most of us now have at least a college degree, and that is most of, you know, I forget the percentage, but I think it's getting close to 20% or higher. You have, have some degree now that is a union member. Uh, we represent quite a few white collar industries, including research, you know, and, you know, and that's another thing we're going to have to work on is to be like, hey, it's not just for you know, the people with the dirt at Bernie's their fingernails anymore. It could be anybody, you know, so. Yeah, that's a good reminder. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, and I, I do think, I think it's totally right. I think unions need to re-engage their members throughout their entire lifespan and, you know, like make sure folks, you know, remember <laughs> like how you got to where you got. And it really, it's like, we have a hard and fast rule that we do not talk politics in my family because it like goes, goes off the rails very quickly. Uh, and I have to hold, bite my tongue an awful lot uh, when I hear the Fox News propaganda coming back at me from these folks who have a wonderful life and a wonderful retirement only because of their union, right? Uh, so I just blame Fox. I blame Fox News for almost everything. Uh, now that Rush Limbaugh is dead, I mostly just blame Fox. Uh, all right, so I wanted to, uh, I wanted one last thing. Tell me what the PRO Act is. You know, what, what, why should we be supporting this? Why is it an important piece of legislation? And can it be passed in reconciliation? Okay, I'm just going to really simplify this. If we could get the PRO Act through, everything that you think should be fair about the process of unionizing, and if you want one in your workplace, would happen. Um, we would undo these right to work laws. Um, and Everything that would force the first contract, 
because that's another tactic to keep out win, but the company can stall forever if they want to. Not really forever, but it just takes so much, pro, you know what I mean, to make, get them to a first contract. You can even recognize a union in some cases. Uh, and basically, if we can get the PRO Act through, and again, I'm going back to most people don't understand that it's not a truly democratic process. Uh, it would make it that way. That's great. So this, like, is this, because I remember during the Obama administration, one of the big priorities of the, our friends in labor was card check. Uh, yes. And that was like, you know, a big piece of what they were pushing for. And if you remember, if you don't remember, because you blocked it out of your memory, that's fine. And that's fully legitimate. Like, you know, we had like three things we wanted to do, right? So it was like healthcare, climate, and card check. Uh, although maybe Matt remembers it as healthcare, card check, and climate. Like we, the, the, the three that, the, the priorities we really wanted out of Obama, and Obama wanted them too, right? And his people all wanted right. them, but we barely got the first thing, <laughs> right? Yeah, and card check. I mean, it's so simple. Your signature is your vote on that authorization card. Very simple. You, might, you know, and it's like, this is my vote. Why should we have to go and go to an NLRB election when I've technically already said I want this? And that's where the companies and the anti-union politicians want to have that long drawn out, basically voting twice process so they can go through the scare tactics and the anti-union propaganda and stalling and everything else. Yeah, uh, AFCA, as we used to call it, uh, you know, I got so, I got to a point where that acronym was stuck in my head during, during those years. Um, it's, again, it's just so frustratingly simple, and we should already have it. And, again, your signature, your vote. Very simple. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to throw it up to my co-host. I'm sorry. I've kind of like absolutely just, you know, filibustered this interview. Uh, but Nate or Ken or we now have Kimberly with us. So uh, whoever has a question for for Matt and, and you know, on the, the the face of the unions and what's going on with labor in Kentucky, feel free to, to pipe in. I'm, I'm, I'm reclaiming our viewers time. Oh, no, I have a question. I have a real question. I, so there's this all this lip ser service about um, you know jobs that shouldn't be unionized because people with these jobs don't deserve any kind of certain wage because it, the job is super easy. So I mean, what what do you say to people who who like oh they don't they don't need to unionize because they have this super cushy easy job that that requires no intelligence to be on it. What do you what do you say to people? Uh, who say that they don't deserve a, a living wage. All work is work. All work deserves dignity, to be treated with dignity. And it, depending on who your employer is, if it's McDonald's, they're making billions so they can afford to pay that can handle union wages, a union retirement. You know, it's, it's, it's a huge difference between mom and pop who might only be getting by on a number of dollars a month versus the corporation. And I just think it gets ridiculous. I mean, I don't care if you're a ditch digger or a doctor, you're a worker. You, you absolutely deserve to be treated with dignity, to make a living wage, especially whoever, if whoever's paying you can afford to do it. Yeah, there we go. You know what? And if if your business can't afford to pay workers a living wage and provide for their health care, well, you got a crappy business and maybe you should go to business and, you know, we'll find a better business. Right. I don't know. It's not like, oh, God, every business is critical, you know, um, but I do think <laughs> it's really important that uh, that I call in Kimberly right now because she's waving at me. Kimberly, what do you got? Thank you, Aaron. I had to bring the beauty and the brains back to the show. No telling what you guys have been doing while I was gone. Wait, we but don't I have do beauty or say... brains? Yeah, it was a, it was an unwatchable mess without you, clearly. Kimberly. You know what? 
Mr. Alley, I'm so sorry you had to contend with this <laughs> in my absence, but I am here now. What I wanted to ask you, just jumping in. Delta 8. What do you think about Delta 8? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm what sorry. do you think about Delta 8? <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry, Matt. That is a, that's a joke what from I last episode. And... Mr. Alley, Mr. Alley, he knows what Delta 8 is. I could tell by the little smile on his face. But that was not my question, Mr. Alley. My question is, because of unions and things of this nature and these companies with their reluctancy to, you know, have their employees be unionized and all of these type of things, I'm seeing more and more companies go into hiring people as independent contractors. Is that some type of way to get around the wage factor? And is that some type of way to make sure that the people that work for them, uh, they're, they're responsible if they get hurt on the job, you know, whatever the case may be, what are your thoughts? Absolutely. I mean, it is the newest uh, trick in the book, let's say. Um, it's the same thing as subcontractors. Let's say, you know, you hire a temp service and that is your workforce looking at you in Toyota. Um, and where those people don't really work for the company. So they're at that liability of like, hey, you know, they don't work for us really. We just provide jobs here. Uh, the gig economy you're talking about, uh, yeah, you know, independent contractors, it sounds great. Uh, but so many people, people out there are actually relying on this being their only jobs, even though they try to present these as like, oh, you can do this in your part time or between, it was picking up those kids between your job and, you know, and after school. It's not really like that for everybody. And yes, this is a way to where, you know, they cannot be unionized because, well, they're not actual employees. And uh, the same thing with subcontractors, unless, you know, I don't care if it's just one workforce working at one place that's subcontractors. According to the labor law, you would kind of have to unionize the entire company of subcontractors, which makes it nearly impossible. Um, and yeah, these are all dirty, all dirty tricks that I'm seeing creeping more and more into Kentucky jobs. Um, it was places is like, oh, we're going to put in a parts factory here, but you find out that, that it's not really working for the company. They're hiring through a temp service, a manpower service, whatever, a staffing firm. And essentially, you're at the mercy of two bosses then, let's say. So. Yeah, and then the one boss is being screwed by the other boss, right? Like, you know, so you know that the manpower folks are answering to toyota's bottom line numbers right? right like and it's but there's like the zero accountability for the workers uh yeah it's like oh how, how could we make a horrible system worse i know let's do this yeah so i mean and i love the jobs that are associated with toyota and i love you know martha lane for bringing toyota here but damn it and, you know with without those right to work laws here in kentucky those folks would have a much better yeah a lot of people are making decent money Right, but in terms of the long term and their ability to kind of be powerful within their workplace, it's very diminished, uh, unfortunately. Right, but there's this thing about those places is having like a ten year turnover for at the most. I mean, that's always been a problem there. You know, most workers often they work in about ten years, and not really happy with anything when you know that's not really a retirement job. Right. Right. Um, Hey, so Matt, I want to just say thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for taking uh, taking your evening and spending it with us. We, uh, I want to let you know it's an open door. If there are issues that you feel like we need to cover uh, and share with our viewers, you know, we'd love to have you back uh, or just shoot us a, you know, we're happy to like add in a call to action to make sure that, you know, union, uh, you know, union concerns are being raised. I know that we are stronger as a society if we have stronger unions. So we want to, you know, be able to partner with you as much as possible to help send, uh, send the messages out and mobilize folks. So thanks again. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So we, uh, we are very, very relieved that Kimberly uh, Cecil Jones has been able to rejoin us and save us from our ugly and uninsightful uh, selves. Uh, we've got the beauty and the brains with Kimberly Cecil Jones. I did want to note, though, I, I had told folks earlier the reason you were gone 
which, uh, you know, was because you were running for an office, you were seeking uh, political uh, power and prestige, and most importantly, you were seeking to help elect Democrats statewide in Kentucky. Tell me, how did it turn out? Did, did the blazer work? Did you <laughs> yes, yes. I called Aaron earlier because, you know, this is my this is my other family. Right. And I'm like so nervous. I didn't know what to wear. I'm burning up in this suit coat right now. But I wanted to project that I am, you know. I'm intelligent, right? So uh, I put this on and Aaron helped me with my two minute speech. Thank you to Aaron. Uh, I was very nervous because I had to do the speech in front of all of the democratic who's who and what's not in the Louisville Jefferson County Democratic Party. But yes, it was 21 to six. Thank you guys. So I'm now the uh, LD at large in my 44th district here in Louisville, Kentucky. So uh, I also want to just say before I close, I really, I really wish I could, I have to go back and look at this because I have always uh, just admired the work that uh, unions do. And on Friday, I wanna report to you guys, to Aaron and Ken and Nate, that on Friday, there will be an inaugural for the brand new president, the first African-American in history in this state. He is going to be on Friday, the president of the Steelworkers Union. So, um, his wife, we now have to call her the first lady. She's like, I'm the first lady. Okay, whatever. She's one of my best friends. But I have always admired what he does, as I do, uh, Mr. Alley, because uh, since the Trump administration and all of these Republicans in Kentucky, they're not really on that, um, you know, union workers train. And we need to get back to that. That's how a lot of people had great health care great benefits, sent their kids to college and were able to build homes and we need to get it back like that again. So in closing today, I would be remiss with this hot jacket. I think I'm going to take it off. I'm about to burn up in all these lights, but always a gracious thank you to our host. And yes, he is my brother. And yes, he is handsome. Okay, I was just kidding earlier. He's handsome. And always to Nate Orshan, great, great person. And also to Ken Howe, our producer. So I wanted everybody to know right now that we are desperately trying to turn this state purple. You know, blue is the ultimate achievement, but you know, we got to start somewhere. It's like real, real red. So let's turn it purple and take back our house and our Senate and make sure that if Andy Bashir runs again, that he will be our governor. Can you imagine life if it still was Matt Bevin? We probably wouldn't even be having this show. It'd be the Gestapo in Kentucky. So also, I just want to say we've up to almost 4,000 people. Like, 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 like it. As we tell all of our guests, you know, make sure that you are also getting all of your friends and family and even the people you don't like to like us, right? And then also, I just want to say that we need you. We cannot do this without you. And I know that your prayers really helped my internet because some of you all hit me up and said, we're praying for your internet, Kimberly. And we really appreciate that because it's working now. <laughs> so we need your help. Once again, you helped me with Kimberly's uh, internet. So now let's turn Kentucky purple. It's only our due right to do so, okay? So we're gonna be like doing some postcards. We're gonna be doing some fun stuff, mobilizing, organizing, and we need your help. So. As usual, I'm the beggar and I'm not too proud to beg. I'm begging you, please come with us. Come with the winning team, right? Now, as we go through that and we want to, you know, make sure that the propaganda that Mitch McConnell, Rand Paul and Andy Barr, you know, that bull crap that they put out, that's what we're doing now. We're diffusing that venom that they put out and we need your help. And also I would like to say that we have this goal of $1,500 
And when I win the lottery on Friday, I'm just going to pay it because I say the same thing every week that we need $1,500. And we've got maybe uh, 12 mm -hmm. or 13% now. We've gone up maybe just a couple of percent. But whatever you may mm -hmm. have, you know, a dollar, $2, $500, mm -hmm. we are so appreciative of whatever you, you feel in your heart that you can do. And then also, you know, I got to give an extra shout out to Mr. Ken Howe at Couch Fire Media. Why? Because Couch Fire Media ignites multi-camera, live stream, fiction, narrative, nonfiction, educational, informative, animation, and commercial video production content. Set your content on fire with Couch Fire Media. And that is www.couchfiremedia. Once again, www.couchfiremedia. So, of course, you know, it's some of us doing some other things as well. And you know what? It's the Jones Report. Yes. With my co-host, Betsy Foster, Secretary of the Louisville Jefferson County Democratic Party, and Mr. Mike Breuer, former senatorial candidate and also uh, a veteran lieutenant colonel in the Marines. So, uh, and of course myself, Kimberly Cecil Jones, that's why it's called the Jones Report, right? So make sure you join us every Tuesday at 7 p.m. It's going to be off the charts. And of course, Ken Howe, Couch Fire Media is our producer as well. Now my girl, Denise Gray, she has Denise Grace, Kentucky Conversations. It's the second Sunday of every month. And you can catch her right there on the Bluegrass Activist Alliance Facebook page. And once again, that great song that you hear that has you kind of moving a little bit, that comes from our very own Nate Orshan. And you can find out more music and listen to your heart's content on www.nato songs, and that's N A T O songs. Dot com. So everyone, do something nice for someone this week, okay? It doesn't cost you anything to smile at someone. Just do something great this week, right? And we want to really thank Mr. Mark Alley. Because Matt, Matt. See, I always give somebody a different name. See, I'll, I will always remember him as Mark, but he's Matt. We just really, really want to thank him for certain for being on our show today and giving us so much great information. So until then, we'll see you next Wednesday at seven o'clock. What am I supposed to do? Aaron, get on here and tell me, what did I miss? What? I, what? Hate, to, I hate to ruin the clothes. You had lovely momentum, uh, but yes, we are taking- oh, we're taking a, what <laughs> It's my fault, on? it's my fault. Y'all know I know this by heart. Fault. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> I, I need a week Why off. I need a vacation. We're taking a break. Ken, ladies first. Ladies first. Well, anyway, uh, I didn't see this. I want to, yeah, we're going to have a powwow after the close. And I'm going to be nice to them, ladies and gentlemen, somewhat. But we love you. God bless you. We'll see you week after next. Right? Week after next. We're taking a break next week, but we will see you on June the 9th when we will be discussing redistricting, joined by our guest, former state representative, James Wayne. Is that John Wayne's brother? See you guys. See you guys week after next. Have a good one. <laughs>